so my name is Simon Pierce from the University of Newcastle and I'm going to uh, give a talk today about uh, Graves' disease, uh, what the current treatments are and what new treatments are in the pipeline and I'm uh, grateful for Lorraine and the, uh, the Thyroid Trust for uh, asking me to um, give the talk. So what we're going to cover today is uh, what causes Graves' disease, uh, what the current treatments are and what treatments are in development and uh, these will um, roughly take uh, five to ten minutes for each section. So what causes thyrotoxicosis or hypothyroidism? Well it's uh, really excess uh, thyroid hormones in the blood or thyroid overactivity and the four main causes are uh, autoimmune stimulation of the thyroid gland which uh, is uh, called Graves disease, uh, nodules which are benign tumours in the thyroid gland uh, making too many thyroid hormones and this would be toxic multinodular goiter or a solitary toxic nodule uh, and then release of preformed thyroid hormones uh, is, is a less common cause that's uh, generally due to thyroiditis or thyroid inflammation and then taking too much thyroxine medication will of course lead to thyrotoxicosis as well uh, but uh, when we're faced with a person with um, thyroid overactivity in the clinic uh, we normally want to think about Graves' disease as our first uh, choice um, uh, differential diagnosis, our, our first choice of what's wrong with them uh, because 80% of thyrotoxicosis is due to Graves' disease so this is the most common cause by a long way. Uh, so uh, Graves was an Irish uh, physician uh, uh, who really uh, he actually wasn't the first to identify the disease, probably identified by uh, many people before, but he certainly made a good study of it and uh, so it led to the, um, the uh, eponym of Graves' disease uh, for that. Uh, so Graves' disease affects women eight times or so more commonly than men. Uh, it can affect your eyes in about 30% of people with thyroid eye disease or Graves' orbitopathy. Um, and it's caused by antibodies in the blood and they stimulate the thyroid to secrete extra thyroid hormones and these antibodies also uh, stimulate thyroid growth so the thyroid gland enlarges in many but not all people with Graves' disease and this is a result of a misdirected uh, immune response. If you think of the immune system as being designed to uh, eliminate bacteria or bugs from your body, uh, in uh, Graves' disease the body makes a mistake and it makes antibodies that start to attack your thyroid gland. Um, the other thing about Graves' disease is it often runs in families and 40% of people uh, with Graves' disease will have someone else in the family who has had either thyroid overactivity or thyroid underactivity uh, as well. So uh, there's a fair genetic component to it. So uh, to understand what causes Graves' disease, uh, we first have to um, uh, look at the normal uh, system of regulation here and sorry uh, and so uh, the body makes TSH or thyroid stimulating hormone uh, which is um, the brain telling the thyroid what to do and TSH comes from the pituitary which is the uh, endocrine gland situated next to the brain so it's really the brain giving a message to the thyroid and this brain's message is called TSH and then on the surface of the thyroid there's uh, this thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, TSH receptor, which you can think of like a switch. It's a funny switch and the TSH binds into this uh, pocket in the, uh, on the blood surface um, of, the, uh, of the thyroid cell and then uh, the wiring runs through the membrane into the cell to tell the thyroid cell uh, whether to make more or less thyroid hormones. So this is the normal situation where the brain's making TSH to switch the thyroid on or switch the thyroid off. Uh, with this TSH receptor being the switch that controls that. But in Graves' disease, what happens is the immune system starts to recognize the TSH receptor as an abnormal protein, and it starts to make antibodies, uh, recently described on the BBC by Fergus Walsh as Y-shaped proteins, which is a, a fair enough description. Antibodies are Y-shaped proteins in general. So uh, these Y-shaped proteins come in and uh, by some, um, if you like, uh, freak of uh, structural biology or freak of nature, the antibodies just happen to have the same shape uh, of TSH. And so they stimulate the thyroid stimulating hormone receptor just like TSH does. And this has the effect of switching the switch on, which causes the thyroid to make much too much uh, thyroxine and triiodothyronine, leading to the state of thyrotoxicosis. 
so these TRAB antibodies, uh, that is TSH receptor stimulating or, or TSH receptor antibodies, um, are really the key thing that's wrong in people with Graves' disease. Uh, so we're going to go over the conventional treatments for Graves' disease now, and, and there are essentially four of those beta blockers, antithyroid drugs, which in the UK would be cabimazole or propyl thiouracil, radioiodine treatment or thyroidectomy, and we'll look into these in a little bit more detail. Uh, so first of all, beta blockers. The common one given is propranolol, but basically any beta blocker works. It's just propranolol works really well and uh, it's been in use for a long time. So endocrinologists tend to reach for the propranolol, but it doesn't really matter what any beta blocker will do. Uh, and in people uh, who have Graves' disease, they very often have a fast heart rate and palpitations are one of the key symptoms of Graves' disease. And so is tremor of the hand and sh general shakiness anxiety and these are both symptoms that beta blockers will control and they'll control them within a matter of an hour or two after taking uh, a propranolol tablet your heart rate will slow down and the tremors will improve so this is this is a good and quick treatment for Graves' disease there's really minimal or no underlying effect on the thyroid itself and pretty much anyone can take uh, beta blockers except if you have asthma or a wheezy chest in which case beta blockers are not allowed and the other exception that we sometimes have is people with peripheral vascular disease that that means cold feet uh, due to vascular disease um, because those feet will get colder and, and it's not a good idea. Uh, so that's beta blockers. Antithyroid drugs in the UK, that's carbimazole or propyl thiouracil. Uh, they stop the thyroid gland making uh, T4 and T3 uh, and they do that by competitively uh, inhibiting uh, the factory, the enzyme that makes uh, thyroid hormones, that, and that enzyme is called thyroproxidase. If you think that's just a little, uh, that's a little protein which is a thyroid hormone uh, uh, factory, and uh, it takes a while for these treatments to work. So certainly when we uh, when we give uh, carbimazole, we don't expect people to really feel any different at all for 7 to 10 days because it takes a while to build up in the thyroid until it can competitively inhibit the thyroproxidase uh, and then it takes a while, 4 to 8 weeks, for someone to be back to normal on these treatments. Uh, and the other thing is because they're competitive um, inhibitors, iodine uh, in your diet or from a CT scan uh, if you have contrast with your CT scan, uh, is an antagonistic action. So sometimes these drugs don't work very well or work less well because people are taking a large amount of iodine in their diet or they've had a CT scan. Often we start off at a higher dose for people with moderate or severe thyrotoxicosis, uh, 40 milligrams a day of carbimazole, and then either we add in thyroxine once the thyroid tests are back in the normal range, which is called block replace, uh, or we reduce the dose uh, after four to eight weeks when the thyroid is back in range, the so-called titration. And we continue these drugs for 12 to 18 months uh, to get a result. So these drugs are both good and bad, upsides and downsides. 50% of people will have, uh, with Gracie's, will be in remission uh, following a year of antithyroid drugs. This is more likely to occur if you're only mildly overactive at the start, if you have a small thyroid gland, uh, women are more likely to be in remission. Uh, people without eye disease and non-smokers are also more likely to be in remission. Uh, the bad sides to the drugs are their side effects. So a rash is annoying and itchy in people, but it does go away in most people after seven days uh, if you don't do anything or just uh, have some antihistamines for the rash. So rash is annoying, but not a, a big deal. Uh, agranocytosis, though, this is when the white blood cells disappear from the blood, make you more prone to infection. This is a serious side effect. So one in 500 uh, to one in 300 people get this reaction. It may be more common in certain ethnic groups, in Asian people, for instance, uh, and this would be manifest as a fever, sore throat, mouth, mouth or tongue ulcers, feeling really very ill, wiped out. And the message is you shouldn't take any more of these drugs until you've had your blood count checked. And in most people, they won't actually have agranocytosis, uh, but very occasionally they do. And it's so important not to take any more drugs until you've had that blood count, because uh, if you carry on with the drugs, uh, this will get worse and you can become really poorly, critically ill with that. Uh, Propyl thyroidal is the other option to carbimazole. Uh, sometimes people don't like taking it because it has a bad taste for some people, uh, but it's also out of favour with doctors because of liver side effects. In adults, probably about 1 in 20,000 will get a serious liver 
uh, liver reaction that co and that causes liver failure in a few people and a few people have died through liver failure having taken propylthiourosal. Uh, it's probably down to about one in 2,000 or so children taking propylthiourosal have that side effect. So it's really banned from use in children nowadays. It may still be used in pregnancy uh, in adults as the first line treatment, uh, but for everyone else it's, it's maybe a short term treatment or something we tend to avoid because of that rare risk of liver failure. Uh, so this just shows you some uh, uh, data about this agranocytosis risk. Uh, so this was a study I did actually uh, 15 or more years ago, which looked at 40 years of, of medical reports to the Committee on the Safety of Medicines, which is the government's, it's now changed into MHRA, but uh, or, or Committee on Safety of Medicines was a part of MHRA. Uh, so this is 40 years of data, which had 117 reports of agranocytosis with antithyroid drugs, and 63 of them reported the time or the latency to the reaction. And what's really interesting is on propylthiouracil, it's 31 days, carbimazole, it's 30 days. And these reactions cluster really quite closely, starting at about seven days and going on to about two or two and a half months after you start the drugs. 90% uh, of the reactions are in that early period of time, from, from a week after you start the drug to about two and a half months uh, after that. And then uh, there are only four reactions um, uh, after three months or so. So uh, once you've been on these drugs for about three or four months, uh, the chance of having a bad reaction like this are very low. It still does occur though, very clearly occurs, uh, so, you, so it's never not going to happen. But after you've been on the drugs for a, a while, this becomes a lot less common. So I'm going to move on to the next treatment, uh, which is radioiodine. And this is just to show you a diffuse uptake of a radioactive tracer in the thyroid gland, uh, showing that the whole thyroid gland is stimulated by the antibodies um, made in Graves' disease. And so you get this diffuse pattern where every part of the gland has a higher uh, uptake of, uh, of tracer. And this is really why radioiodine works. A single dose of uh, radioiodine, which is uh, 131 iodide, is taken as a capsule or a drink. It works in 80 to 90% of gray disease with a single dose. Uh, and uh, you do have to take some radiation protection measures. That's avoid close contact. We normally say a meter or an arm's length uh, from adults uh, and, uh, and children. So for adults, it's 11 days, which means uh, sleeping apart from uh, your spouse or, or your boyfriend or whatever. Uh, and uh, also uh, you should avoid kids and pregnant women for about three weeks. Uh, after a, a normal dose of radioiodine. Um, most people will go hypothyroid and need lifelong thyroxine tablets. And so this, um, so this is a really effective treatment, uh, but 95% of people with Graves' disease, because it's going to wipe out your whole gland, uh, will go hypothyroid. So uh, radioiodine is actually the favoured uh, treatment uh, from NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the benign thyroid disease guidelines uh, published last year. Uh, it says offer radioactive iodine is the first line definitive treatment for adults with Graves' disease. And then they have a few exceptions as to who shouldn't be offered radioiodine rather than uh, who should be offered. So this is the default treatment for Graves' disease. Unless antithyroid drugs are very likely to achieve remission. Uh, if it's uh, unsuitable, for instance, if there's a suspicion of thyroid cancer, if the person is pregnant or trying to become pregnant, then it is bad for the baby. Or if they have active thyroid eye disease, about 15%, 1-5% of people who receive radioiodine will develop thyroid eye disease or have worsening thyroid eye disease. That means 85% don't have that problem. So there are a few myths about radioiodine. Uh, certainly your head doesn't fall out. Uh, your fertility is normal uh, after a dose, but you're not allowed to become pregnant for six months or father a child for four months. And that's because then maybe we want to avoid any risk uh, to the fetus. And uh, probably to be honest, after about three months, it's totally out of your system. But the rules are you shouldn't become pregnant for six months just to be ultra cautious. Uh, there's no cancer risk from the major cancers that people get. So, in fact, the studies show that the common cancers may be lung cancer, bowel cancer, etc. There's a slight reduction in risk, if anything, and that's because the person, uh, obviously, this is people who have been followed up for 10 or 20 years after their dose of radioiodine in the population, uh, because these people have seen a doctor and the doctor said, by the way, it might be a good idea if you stop smoking or cleaned up your diet or whatever and, and so uh, the, so there's no significant cancer risk there may be slight increase in 
uh, a couple of cancers. One is thyroid cancer, and that's most likely because you've had a thyroid doctor examining your thyroid, and so more thyroid cancers are picked up that way. Uh, but also uh, duodenal cancer, and, and probably there's a very small dose of radioiodine uh, to your stomach because your sw it's just stomach and duodenum because you're swallowing the, the radioiodine, and, and that gives you the problem. Uh, so uh, people don't glow in the dark after this treatment. There's no need to eat kryptonite or anything like that. It's a really safe and certain and effective treatment, and we've been using it uh, since 1943. So it, it's it's not a, a trendy idea. It's just a very reliable treatment for for thyroid overactivity. So thyroidectomy is similar to radioiodine. It's a safe and it's a certain treatment. It's been uh, in regular use since uh, about the turn of the last century, since the 1900s to 1910s. Uh, the operation takes uh, 90 to 120 minutes. Uh, neck is cut horizontally and you end up with about a three inch scar uh, with most surgeons. And nowadays you'll have one night in hospital after the operation. Uh, there's about a 2% risk of a permanent uh, voice problem or uh, uh, a low blood calcium hypoparathyroidism because the parathyroid glands get damaged uh, more than two percent get a transient problem with calcium which might mean you have to take tablets for a month or two but then those go back to normal uh, you'll have to take lifelong thyroxine tablets uh, after your thyroidectomy and of course you've had to have a general anesthetic you end up with a scar so this just shows you a thyroidectomy scar uh, three months after the operation and then after it fades to a, a, a white line. This is easy to hide for most people either in a skin crease in, the, in an older person than this uh, or with a necklace or a polo neck if you're or a collar if you um, want to do that. It's not such a difficult place to, uh, to hide a scar. Uh, so uh, thyroidectomy is a particularly good treatment if you have a really big thyroid gland uh, but also if you have difficult to control thyroid overactivity, that is if you don't become uh, euthyroid or your thyroid tests don't normalize with uh, 40 milligrams of carbimazole. If, if you have active uh, thyroid eye disease, which are normally sore eyes due to thyroid eye disease, uh, then thyroidectomy is also, um, the option would be radioiodine, which is not a good idea in that situation. So surgery becomes um, marginally preferable. <coughs> so this kind of summarizes where we are with these three different treatment options. Uh, Antithyroid drugs, carbimazole, methimazole outside the UK, propyl thiouracil. The upside of this is just a tablet you have to take every day and you'll take it for 12 to 18 months in general. Uh, the downsides are the side effects, including the agranocytosis. You're coming back to the thyroid clinic for two years to see your endocrinologist. Uh, and then it still only works in 50% uh, of people. So, uh, so this is actually an uncertain treatment. Uh, and so we don't know at the beginning who's going to be cured by this treatment or not. And so you're taking a gamble, and the real gamble is, will you get a side effect? Uh, how well will you feel on the treatment? Uh, and will it work in the long term? Uh, but you do stand a chance of getting back to normal with uh, antithyroid drugs if they work for you. Uh, radioiodine is a much more certain treatment. It's going to work in 90% of, of people with Graves' disease. Uh, it's really convenient. It's a single dose. Uh, and you could uh, be diagnosed with gross disease, have a dose of radioiodine. Uh, four to six weeks later, uh, your thyroid will be wiped out uh, probably three to four months later, and you'll be on levothyroxine tablets for the rest of your life, and you won't need to come back to hospital. Your GP can monitor the levothyroxine. So within uh, eight or nine months, your episode of gross disease can be over. Um, you do have to take the radiation protection measures for 10 or 11 days after the dose of radioiodine. And of course, we wouldn't want to give it to people with eye disease because about 15% of people will have eye disease worsened by the radioiodine. That can actually be mitigated by giving steroids, but that's a whole other subject. This is an unpopular option. Lots of people don't like the idea of receiving radiation, which is maybe understandable, but it has been in use for a long term, for a long time, and it is uh, safe. And of course, you're going to have lifelong hypothyroidism, which uh, will be treated with levothyroxine after that. Thyroidectomy is good in, in many ways in that it's a quick job. You have a thyroid making too many thyroid hormones one day and then literally 24 hours later it's gone and then you're just on levothyroxine. It's a really certain treatment. Well, nothing works in 100% of, of patients, but in 99.8% thyroidectomy will take your whole thyroid out and it's never going to come back unless your surgeon's a very inexperienced surgeon or unless your operation goes uh, surprisingly badly, but which is extremely rare in, in the NHS. We have lots of good thyroid surgeons in the UK. Of course, you have to have general anaesthetic. 
you get a scar, there's this small 2% risk of other neck damage, and then it's lifelong levothyroxine. Now, in some cultures, having a scar in your neck is considered mutilation. So, uh, for instance, in, in Japan and in Korea and places, there are surgeons now who will take your thyroid out using a cut in your armpit and uh, bury th underneath the skin and top of your chest wall to get into your neck to take the thyroid out uh, th uh, through there. Or even some um, doctors will use, some surgeons will use an approach from the side of the neck because it seems a bit less unsafe less a bit uh, less uh, unsightly having a scar at the side of your neck than at the front of your neck um, and there's also even a trend for taking out your thyroid through your mouth by cutting underneath your tongue and, and pulling it upwards from your neck so uh, so this isn't a popular option uh, particularly for some uh, young women but uh, it's it's uh, a long established treatment and it is really effective and we have lots of good surgeons. <coughs> so when you consider all these treatments, there's no uh, there's no treatment that's overwhelmingly the best, no treatment that's overwhelmingly the worst. So maybe we ought to think about what happens to people in the long term. And so this is a nice um, uh, study from Sweden of nearly a thousand people treated with Graves' disease between 2003 and 2005. And quality of life was measured. Uh, uh, six to ten years after their first diagnosis using uh, Torquil Watts um, FIPRO questionnaire and you can see a variety of um, different domains here, goiter symptoms, hyperthyroid symptoms, hypothyroid symptoms, eye symptoms, tiredness, cognition, anxiety, depression, emotional susceptibility, impaired social life, impaired daily life, impaired sex life and the appearance and what you can see, so uh, this is healthy people shown in the dotted line there. The, uh, th this is what we're aspiring to, the healthy line, because that's what normal people have got. Uh, Antithyroid drugs in green, surgery in red, and then radioiodine in blue. And you can actually see that radioiodine is worst for uh, every domain except for appearance, in which surgery is just a little bit worse. Uh, what's interesting, though, is for several domains, there's no difference between surgery, antithyroid drugs, and the healthy population. So all down the left-hand side here, um, uh, you can see the healthy population that overlaps with uh, antithyroid drugs and pretty much with surgery as well for um, uh, impaired sex life, impaired daily life, impaired social life, um, and emotional susceptibility. Uh, it doesn't, these treatments are worse, though, uh, for uh, depression, uh, but radioiodine is still the worst, anxiety. Actually, there's little difference between uh, the healthy population and people who have had antithyroid drugs uh, or surgery uh, there for tiredness, but radioiodine is clearly worse for tiredness, and these are all um, uh, slightly decreased in with each of the treatments. Uh, but uh, the worse off being people with radioiodine. So we ought to consider this, and this study actually came out too late to be included in the NICE evidence base uh, to make those recommendations about uh, radioiodine being the first-line treatment because the, this study was uh, published after uh, the NICE um, cutoff for literature consideration.